had been working at this company for over three years at the base level, entry level, actuarial analyst role before getting a promotion, even though I was a fellow. Hello, aspiring actuaries. If we haven't met before, I'm Michelle. I am a fellow of the Casualty Actuarial Society, a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, and I currently work as a personal lines pricing actuary for a major property and casualty insurer in the province of Ontario, Canada. Today I thought it could be interesting for you guys to hear what my life has been like for the last two and a half plus years since I became a fellow of the Casualty Actuarial Society. Whether you're someone who's just starting out on your actuarial journey trying to figure out if it's even something that you want to do, or you're struggling through those actuarial exams and you're just wondering if there is really a light at the tunnel, I hope that by sharing my experience you can get a little bit of insight into what life is like as an actuary. And that's actually what I really want to do with this channel. I know I haven't been posting for the last two plus years. Sorry. But when I envision what I want this channel to be, I want it to be threefold. I want to show you guys how actuaries live with videos like this, with day in the life of an actuary videos. I want to teach you guys things that actuaries know, real actuarial concepts that I apply day to day in my work life. And I want to help guide you along your actuarial journey, maybe with study tips, maybe with motivation, I don't know. I just want to make the actuarial profession seem accessible and fun because honestly, it can be a little bit intimidating. You've got a lot of actuarial exams, you've got a lot of years of studying, and it's hard. But hopefully, maybe, if you follow me along my journey and see what my life is like, it can help you decide what you want to do with the rest of your life. What a scary concept. June 2017 was a really big month for me. I spent my entire life growing up in Montreal and there was really never a point in my life where I thought that I would ever live anywhere other than Montreal and yet somehow, some way, the universe told me, nope, you're gonna move to Toronto and so in June 2017, I did. I'm very fortunate that the company that I worked for in Montreal is still the company that I work for today. They were super accommodating and super accepting of the fact that I wanted to move from the Montreal office to the Toronto office. Even though the reason I wanted to move was not work related, it was entirely because uh, I had a boyfriend in Toronto and I wanted to be with him. Spoiler, we are not together anymore. Oops, you know, like, things happen. But the move to Toronto was actually a really good decision and I really do love living in Toronto, so uh, that was a good move. I guess the world works in mysterious ways. The exam results for my final actuarial exam, the one that would tell me if I really did become a fellow of the Casualty Actuarial Society at the age of 25, were supposed to come out on the day of my first day of work in the Toronto office. So that was gonna be a big day. And it's a little bit intimidating because as soon as exam results come out, everyone knows, everyone's sort of crowding around the exam writer's cubicle saying, did you pass, did you not, did you pass, did you not? But what actually happened is, I don't know if I should say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. There was sort of a uh, situation on the CAS website where if you had a URL and you had your candidate number, then you could just replace like a string of numbers in that URL and you could get your passing slip the day before the exam results were supposed to come out. So I actually knew that I became a fellow a day before I was supposed to know that I became a fellow, a day before I started. So I sort of showed up in the morning and I didn't tell people that I knew that I was a fellow, even though we had all sort of checked because we all passed the information around and then when the actual results came out I checked and I was like whoo fellow life it's been so long I don't remember what I was feeling whether it was relief or excitement but probably just neutral probably just like I'm really glad that this is over there is a two-month gap between when you take the actuarial exam and when they tell you whether or not you passed or failed for the advanced exams because they are handwritten, they're not computer based. So at that point I had sort of gotten over it and I was like maybe I passed, maybe I didn't, I don't know, I'm not gonna get excited. And honestly I was so fed up with actuarial exams that there was part of me that was like if I fail, I don't know if I'm retaking it, I'm just gonna quit, I'm just gonna go, I'm gonna, I don't know, join the circus, do something ridiculous because I cannot deal with all these actuarial exams. That was a little bit of my mindset. But I passed, thankfully, and here I am 
<laughs> fellow. The most immediate change that I saw when I became a fellow was my salary because at my company I did get a 5% raise for passing the exam and a 5% raise for my title so that was a really nice little salary boost. Definitely appreciated it after going from living with my parents in Montreal and not paying any rent to moving to Toronto and having to pay rent. Things get a little bit more expensive when you're not just mooching off your parents. But otherwise immediately nothing really changed. I mean I was on a new team. I was a beginner again. I had spent two and a half years on my previous actuarial team and I had gotten really used to all the processes, I knew all the databases, I knew what was going on, I was like a go-to person, and now I was a beginner again. At my company in the actuarial department we have three levels of what are called individual contributors. These are people who are not responsible for managing anyone else, they're just responsible for doing their own work. Yes, you are responsible for coaching other people when you're a little bit more experienced, but you're not their direct supervisor. You're not a manager of any person. The levels at my company are called Actuarial Analyst, Senior Actuarial Analyst, and Actuarial Consultant. I stayed an Actuarial Analyst for a full year after I got my fellowship. I had been working at this company for over three years at the base level, entry level, actuarial analyst role before getting a promotion, even though I was a fellow. I know that there are some companies where promotions are entirely tied to title, and honestly, I kind of prefer it the way that they do it at my company. There are people who are senior actuarial analysts who do not have a title. There are people who are consultant actuaries who do not have a title. It's really based on what you can do and not based off of just whether or not you can write an exam, which is kind of may be demotivating to those of you who are just trying to pass your exams, but honestly, passing exams does not mean that you can do the work. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, it took you a year to get promoted, so I guess that means that you're not very good at doing your work. Uh, I would say no to that. Uh, every evaluation that I've ever had in my company was always like, your work is top, your work is 10 on 10, your work is excellent. Up to the evaluation that I had, within the last month is when we did our annual evaluation for 2019 and frankly it was uh, very upsetting. <laughs> right now I am still at that senior actuarial analyst level. I have not made it up to consultant actuary and the feedback that I got even this time I've been told for over a year was your work is at consultant level, your work is at consultant level, but every evaluation that I have gotten at this company since the beginning has always been your work tops. The how you do it is what they say. They love saying the how you do it. Shh, not good. They don't like my mouth. I like to talk. If I have a thought, I say it. And sometimes I can come off as rude, sometimes I can come off as too argumentative, and they're like, well, we can't promote you because blah 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 whatever. Like, honestly, <laughs> if I had a number one thing that I disliked about uh, working a corporate job, and this isn't a, a bash on any of my managers because honestly I think they're all amazing. I've had quite a few managers just because I have changed teams and people get promoted and people move around and so I've had multiple managers and I have had consistent feedback the entire time. The feedback has always been work, great, personality, garbage. And I'm like, well, <laughs> honestly that's just... Uh, <laughs> crush my soul a little bit. But that's not the point of this video, so we're gonna move on to a lighter topic because, uh, yeah. I mentioned that I'm also a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, but that came much later on. I became a fellow of the CAS in 2017, but a fellow of the CIA in 2019. The reason why they don't line up perfectly is because to become a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, in addition to all the exams that I had to write for the CAS, there are also years experience requirements, and because I did become an FCAS very young, I didn't have all the years experience that I needed to become a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, which I think is a really good rule, to be honest. Like, when I finished my exams, I would not have said that I was comfortable being an actuary, I've been working for five years now and honestly I still don't really know what an actuary is but I just sort of keep showing up and people keep telling me that I do good work so I'm like okay fine I guess I'm doing something right I don't know. Once I did have enough years experience to become a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries I'll be honest they make the process to apply for it just really annoying. There are so many 
different things that you have to fill out and different documents that you have to get that I did procrastinate for a little while. Now in Canada, a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries is what you need to be able to sign something as an actuary, to be able to say an actuary did this work and an actuary says that this is up to the actuarial standards. A fellow of the Casualty Actuarial Society in Canada doesn't get you that. It says, I've passed all my exams, I'm up to the level, but it doesn't allow you to sign as an actuary. I mentioned earlier that I work as a pricing actuary. What this means specifically is that I, along with my team, because I definitely do not do this alone, come up with prices for car and home insurance in the province of Ontario, Canada. In Ontario, home insurance prices are not regulated. This means that I could come up with any price I wanted to and we can get it in the system and we can just let it go. We can just take it, run with it, go with it, put it in the system, charge people whatever price we wanted. We are bound by actuarial standards of practice. We are bound by our code of ethics as actuaries. So even though it's not regulated, I couldn't charge someone a different price based off of the color of their skin. For example, even though there is no regulator coming to say why are you charging person A and person B different prices for their home insurance, I as an actuary cannot say that the color of their skin is a reason why I am differentiating between these two people. Car insurance, on the other hand, is a regulated line of business. This means that every time my company wants to change our prices for car insurance, we do have to provide actuarial justification to the regulator and it has to be signed by an actuary. Before I became a fellow of the Canadian Institute of Actuaries, I was working on these rate filings. However, I was not the actuary overseeing it and I was not the actuary signing it. I have since September 2019 signed multiple filings. I am the official actuary on record for several auto rate changes in the Ontario province. Going back to 2017, one of my first major projects that I worked on was called Rate Level Indications. Now this is one of the bread and butter actuarial concepts that I may or may not decide to break down in a future video. Insurance companies aren't selling you coffee. We're not selling you pads of paper. We are selling you protection from risk. We are dealing in risk. And that is why actuaries work for insurance companies because we find a way to quantify risk. Now we sell our customers this risk protection for a price. And what this price is meant to cover is the expected future costs of all claims, meaning if you get into a car accident, we have to pay the car accident, all the expenses associated with handling these claims, and profit. The price that you pay supports claims, expenses, and profit. As a pricing actuary, I'd say we have two main goals. The first one is to make sure that overall, if we expect $100 million worth of claims, expenses, and profit, we need to collect $100 million worth of premium. So in aggregate, we need to make sure that this is in balance. If we project that we're going to be collecting 90 million in premium and that we're going to have $120 in claims, well, we're off balance. If we project that we're gonna be collecting $300 million in premium, but only have like a million dollars worth of claims, well, that would be just absolutely absurd. But we need to make sure that these are in balance. The second main objective of a pricing actuary is to charge the right price to the right person. We might know that on average, we need to charge everyone $1,000, but maybe we know that this person is riskier than that person, so we charge one person $1,500 and another person $500. The act of deciding who to charge what is what we would call segmentation, and the act of looking at the overall aggregate level and making sure that we're collecting enough money in aggregate is what we would call our rate level indications. And that was the first project that I worked on rate level indications, making sure that we're going to collect enough premium and if we are not, we need to figure out what we're going to do about it as a company. Either find ways to reduce expenses or find ways to raise premium or find ways to reduce our claim cost, but we need to get this in balance. It's definitely an interesting exercise. When you're studying to be an actuary, a lot of the problems that you do at school, a lot of the problems on the actuarial exams are very black and white. This is the process that you use and then you get to the right answer. Whereas a rate level indication is just a series of assumptions and you tweak an assumption by 1% and all your numbers go way out of whack. It's wild. It involves a lot of discussions with a lot of different people, a lot of different teams. You need to know if the underwriters are changing what they're doing. Underwriters are the people who decide who we want to insure, who we don't want to insure. 
We need to know how claims teams are changing their processes because if they're going to do something that's going to reduce our claim cost, well, we don't want to raise our premiums if we know that we're going to be reducing our claims because then we'd be out of whack again. We need to keep everything in balance. We need to be aware of changes in the products that we offer as an insurance company. We need to be aware of reforms. We need to be aware of changes in technology. A car accident five years ago is not like a car accident today. A bumper is not just a bumper anymore. A bumper has sensors and cameras and blinkers and this and that. And so you can't just take a bumper and replace it. You need to take it somewhere where the person knows how to change all the electronic elements of it. You can tell I'm really not a car person. I don't know. But it's more expensive to repair when it's got all this electronic tech in a bumper. It's not just like metal anymore. I would consider myself to be a very data-driven person. I've said on this channel in the past, I code in SAS at work and I love coding in SAS. I love manipulating my databases, but in an exercise like rate level indications, it's not okay to just be data-driven. If you see your data is going weird or you see a change in the trend, you can't just say, well, I guess this is the reality now. This is what the data is saying. You need to try to understand what happened? Are we ensuring a different profile of person? Are we doing something different? Did something change in the environment? What is going on? Did we have worse weather? Do we have better weather? How is that impacting claims? How do things aggregate? Are we ensuring too many people in the same area such that when there's a tornado, it just hits all of our insurance because we insure all the people on the same block? I've done that exercise a couple times now and it's really interesting. It really gives you a really nice macro view of what's going on at the insurance company. Another project that I've worked on in the last couple years since I started working as a pricing actuary is monitoring our top line. Top line in an insurance company is what we would refer to the business that is coming in who we're insuring, how much premium we're collecting for them. If we increase prices on people who drive red cars, we would expect to see fewer people who drive red cars coming into our book of business proportionally. Now I'll tell you a secret. I cannot promise that this is true at every single insurance company, but the color of your car is not a variable that we use at my insurance company. No one will ask you that. I know that some people think that red cars are more expensive to insure. Maybe that's true somewhere definitely not true where I am. You can buy whatever color car you want, your polka dotted pink Pepto-Bismol colored car, absolutely fine, will not impact anything. Lots of things will impact it, but color of your car is not one of them. If you want a whole video on why your car insurance is going up, like, I would be happy to tell you all about the things that are making car insurance more expensive right now. But back to top line, as we change our prices, other companies are also changing their prices. And because we sell the insurance product before we actually know if the person is going to have a claim, before we know if this person is gonna cost us money, before we know how much this person is gonna cost us, we're really all guessing. And so what's concerning to us is if we start seeing big growth in a certain segment of our book, let's say people who drive red cars, but we know that we didn't change anything that would impact whether or not people who drive red cars should be coming to our company. That's concerning. What that tells us is that one of our competitors saw something and said, people who drive red cars, they're really dangerous. We need to raise their prices. And so those people saw a big price increase. Those people said, we need to shop around. Those people came quoted with us, saw that it was cheaper, and now we're a little bit scared. So we need to be aware of what's going on in our book of business, see what's happening in the market, see what's happening in the industry, and see if we trust our prices or if we need to reflect it. Every four months we have new interns come and work at our office, and so I do some onboarding sessions with them. We have a, a series set up by different actuaries at the company just to teach them different concepts. And one of the questions that I ask the new interns is always, okay, I get that pricing insurance is like a little bit weird, but we already have insurance prices, so why is pricing a full-time job? Like, the prices are already there. What do I do all day? And honestly, I ask myself that same question all the time because I'm like, listen, we already have prices. How is there always something to change? But the market is constantly changing. There's constantly things to react to. There are constantly things that we want to tweak, things that we want to get better. I don't know, somehow, I got a full-time job, I'm still doing it, I've been there two and a half years, pricing, 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 and like, looking at the year ahead, we have so many pricing changes planned, oh my goodness, it's so much work, there is no shortage of work in my team right now.
no shortage. Another kind of project that I wanted to bring up that I've already alluded to a few times in the past is segmentation changes. I have worked on changing prices for specific segments of our book. Anything from full algorithm refreshes to just tweaking it a little bit saying these people seem underpriced, these people seem overpriced, let's just and then filing with the regulator if it was auto or not filing with the regulator and just putting it in the system if it was a home insurance policy and not a car insurance policy. I don't know why I got confused and I was like, what's regulated, what's not? Car insurance regulated, home insurance, free for all. Since I do work for a major property and casualty insurer and we do have so many teams, we are quite segmented in the roles that we play. Like my team is just pricing person lines Ontario. We have other teams that will price commercial lines. We have other teams that will price other provinces. Everything is really divided up, so we have a rotation program at my company, meaning that every three-ish years, people will change roles. For that reason, I am currently the most experienced person on my team, which is a lot a bit scary because, like I mentioned before, I don't feel like I know what I'm doing. One of the things that I should is kind of entirely in my job description, but not necessarily something that I always do all the time is coaching the more junior people on my team or not even more junior, just less experienced with our databases or less experienced with how the team functions or less experienced with pricing because we might have someone who comes from reserving who's never touched pricing or might have someone who comes from commercial lines who's not familiar with the personal lines databases. So a big part of my job is coaching other people, sharing the knowledge that I have, teaching them all about what it's like to be a personal lines pricing actuary and how we change our prices and how we make sure that everything is 10 on 10 excellent. I don't know what I'm doing. I haven't been on YouTube in a long time. If those are things that you would want to learn about, like just how people come up with insurance prices and what I do day to day, I kind of do want to film a day in the life of an actuary video, maybe kind of one day sort of take you along to work with me, but not actually in my office because I can't show you the like confidential information that I'm working with like this is a real policyholder information that I deal with so I couldn't like put a camera on the screen but I could show you what I do a little bit in theory hypothetically talk you through my day I don't know if that's interesting probably maybe subscribe if that's interesting to you thumbs up this video because I'm back on YouTube and that's terrifying because I'm older now. If you're currently studying for an actuarial exam, good luck. Remember to give yourself permission to take breaks from studying. It is so important to just zone out, be chill, get in a good mindset, and you can do anything you want to do. Study affirmations. Love it. Everything is knowable. Good luck aspiring actuaries and I'll see you soon. Thank you for calling. Bye!